As y'all have heard me say before, the most important part of planning any adventure are the snacks. And if you're looking for a delicious and nutritious snack that packs a real protein punch, crack into a good source of protein with tasty, healthy, wonderful pistachios. Each one ounce serving of wonderful pistachios contains six grams of protein giving you over 10% of your daily value in that one serving. It's one of the highest protein nuts out there. And that's not all. Pistachios are also known for the fiber and better for you unsaturated fats, which may help keep you feeling fuller longer. Best part, wonderful pistachios come in a variety of flavors and sizes. Perfect for enjoying with your family and friends or taking them with you on your summer adventures for those snacks we're talking about. So whether you're dropping off the kiddos or running between meetings or about to climb a mountain, fuel up with a healthy and tasty snack. Wonderful Pistachios will be your new go-to. You can check them out at wonderfulpistachios.com and learn more about how these little green wonders can power up your day. Hey folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast, getting the episode out a little bit later again this week. Uh, Just can't seem to get back on track. It's been so stinking busy with life and family. Uh, These Thursdays come around and I I, I just lose track of time. Um, But this episode is kind of go, going back to something that that a lot of us dream about leaving corporate America to pursue our passion and you know I've seen my fair share of that over the years and this story Angie's going to share is about that uh, but it's not meant to make you feel dissatisfied with corporate America I work in corporate America and I uh, there's tons of benefits there's a lot of security there's a lot of things I love about it uh, are there things that I wish I could go back to with a, more of a vagabond lifestyle? For sure. Uh, but I have responsibilities. I have kids that I love and I have folks I take care of. And, uh, you know, that uh, having a job that's really secure helps provide that. And so, it, you know, it's all about phases of life. And what's cool about Angie's story is she's not in this uh, role anymore. She's, I don't think she's a pro enduro mountain bike racer anymore believe she's become a mom and got married after this and don't moved on to doing other things you can still be a pro athlete and be a parent of course but it's like it was a time where this was possible and took the took the leap and that's the thing about you know going off and doing these adventures a lot of times we talk to the people on this show the thing we're discussing is not a very long experience in their life in fact it's a really short thing. It's maybe a week long or a couple days long sometimes. And other times it's maybe a couple years long, but you know, there's usually a sweet spot around a few weeks or months. Uh, but that's all the time you need to have a life changing experience. Go talk to anybody about a pivotal moment in their life or something that helped them see things in a new way. It's not, it doesn't take years. It could be, it could be an instant. And so, uh, Angie's story is cool because this is a really cool moment in time for her back in 2018. This is one of the earliest episodes I ever did. And we're going to talk about her transition out of corporate America into being a professional athlete. And uh, maybe we'll do an update one day. But I, I remember this being a cool story. One of my very first interviews ever. So if you don't like it, if it's cringy, if I don't know what I'm doing at that point, I, I definitely don't, still don't know what I'm doing, don't hold it against me. All right, let's go ahead and dive in. Angie. How's it going, Mason? Yeah, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate where, it. So where are you coming from today? Well... That's kind of a, a hard question to answer, but currently I am sitting in Eden, Utah. All right. Um, working at my new job at a Whisper Ridge Cat and Helicopter uh, Backcountry Resort, and uh, just taking a little bit of time away to, to chat with you. It's starting to get really crazy as we get closer to the uh, to the winter season. Um, our uh, our books are starting to fill pretty fast, so. Yeah, it's a really exciting time because we're in the fourth year of operation and 
Um, this is the kind of the, the year of, of scaling the business and, and growth and lots of really good things happening. So, um, it's, it's really a fun thing to be a part of. Yeah. And, and I'll just give a quick background. You're, you're a pro enduro mountain bike racer. You, you love to snowboard. Um, you lived in a van for like six months through a van do it. Uh, you're a brand ambassador for peak refuel as well as what you just mentioned, Whisper Ridge in Utah. But Mm -hmm. um, all this is relatively new to you, correct? Oh, absolutely. Um, So kind of the the long and short of it is I spent, I'm I'm originally from Texas. All right. And uh, I have been doing business to business sales, predominantly medical device sales, for, since I got out of college in 2003, and um, fortunately, that um, that career path did afford me the means and a little bit of flexibility to be able to um, chase mountain sports. So, just throughout my my 20s and early 30s, you know, I, I uh, have been mountain biking, riding motocross, chasing snowstorms, going on downhill mountain bike trips, and just really like being a Texan. A lot of people are like, how, you know, how are you good at snowboarding being a Texan? Well, because I have just, I've spent all my money chasing, chasing storms and, and, uh, chasing mountain sports. So I finally, you know, the last probably three or so years, I just really started to get bogged down by the, like the daily corporate chase, the grind. Like, yes, I was allowed, I was able to take trips, but I just found myself the last three years, just kind of waking up depressed and not being happy with what I was doing, knowing that I wasn't, um, I wasn't serving the purpose that I feel like my life was intended for. And I don't, I don't really, I'm trying to figure out what that intention is or like what, what my passions are that are going to give me a little bit of a, more of a fulfilled life. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, like I, uh, I've been mountain biking since 2003 and I, I learned my love for, for downhill and going, you know, doing, doing drops and jumps and railing berms. I, I kind of found that love as I started taking downhill trips, like in 2005 ish. And, uh, so just two years ago, enduro racing really started getting really popular in Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. And there were some really good series there that I entered into and started winning them and uh, just really decided that, you know what, I just, I kind of want to take a midlife sabbatical because I've, I have just grinded it out so hard, you know, in my, in my twenties and early thirties. And like, I was starting to have that feeling that a lot of people have, like, you know, this life is really short and I'm not going to be young forever and I'm not going to have this body forever. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't want to spend it waking up every day, you know, grinding it out and like essentially passing up on my youth. Mm. I was also very unhappy in healthcare sales. It's just becoming a really, really stressful and negative place to work. And, uh, oh, man, I, I, can just, imagine. I wanted to change my life. I just, I wanted to make a change. So I decided because I had won, you know, all these races and race series that I wanted to try to essentially be a professional racer on a national level. So instead of sitting around whining and having the poor pitiful me, you know, attitude in life, I decided to make some changes. So, um, I started really actively, um, kind of re- you know, searching for sponsors and became a brand ambassador, um, and, a, and got sponsored by we are one composites, which is a wheel company out of Canada. They're amazing. Hmm. And, uh, and Ellsworth bikes got those two sponsorships. And then I decided that the missing link to me leaving my career and trying to do this professional race thing was lodging on the road. Like how was I, I didn't want to pay for hotels cause that would run me dry. Definitely. Yeah. I didn't want to just sleep in my car cause that was going to eventually become uncomfortable. Yeah. I'd, I'd get old. I, I agree. Yeah. So I reached out to uh, Van Do It and asked them if they would be willing to partner with a, you know, uh, kind of gave them my story. You know, I wanted to kind of live the dream of quitting my corporate life and chasing a passion. And they said immediately, yes, let's do this. So once That's I signed awesome. contract with them, I quit my job two weeks later. And then three weeks later, I was uh, I had a U-Haul in tow on the way to, to Missouri to pick up my new van. 
And uh, in April, I set out on the road and uh, headed to my first race. Which was where? It was in Arkansas. It was the first race of the new Arkansas Enduro Series. And for anybody that's into mountain biking, Arkansas is probably the, the leading state in mountain biking right now. Like they are absolutely Bentonville, like Northwest Arkansas. They are creating an incredible mountain bike scene. That's like nothing I've ever seen. It's, it's just incredible. And it all has to do with the, the Walmart foundation pumping millions and millions of dollars into making Bentonville the most livable city in America. And it's just really, really amazing. Wow. It's an amazing place to go ride bikes. I did not know that. Oh yeah, just do a little research. I mean, you you can you can Facebook, you can Google, just Northwest Arkansas, Bentonville, Oz Trails, Arkansas Enduro Series. Um, I mean, there, there's just there is a wealth of bike awesomeness that's happening there right now. If I didn't get a job at Whisper Ridge, which is a kind of a dream job for me, I would have moved to Arkansas, no question. Man. Which is just crazy. I never thought in my life I'd say I'd want to live in Arkansas, but Arkansas is a very special place. Yeah, I, I've been to, I've I've spent a lot of time in the Ozarks, and they are surprisingly, absolutely stunning mountains and scenery. And I can imagine some of the routes they've built around there are are world class. That's so crazy. I yeah. was totally not aware of that. So so you mentioned Bentonville being kind of uh, up and coming bike uh mecca is there been any place that surprised you like man this place is overrated like it's not as great as people say it is uh you know i went to a lot of places in colorado this summer so oh no that's where we are (laughs) (laughs) no and and I, i can only speak to um to that because um so kind of to back up a little bit so I went to Arkansas to go to my first race. I won it. It was the biggest, it was the biggest, uh, winnings that I've ever had. It was a $2,000 prize for first place in pro women's. And that was pretty incredible to win. Um, and then I was off to my next, um, race in Santa Fe, which was my very first national pro race. It was the, uh, it was the big mountain enduro um, at Glorietta camps in Arkansas. And I, uh, got there a week early. I was, you know, it was my first national race in my van. I was super excited. Like life was starting for me, new chapter, did a couple of days of practice and my very last stage, which is just one of the downhill stages. I crashed on a big drop that I actually really didn't want to do, but I kind of felt that pro pressure to do it. Hmm. And, uh, I crashed and broke my shoulder. Oh man. In that very instance, I watched my entire dreams, like all my dreams that I'd been planning for just crumble around me. It was one of the hardest, most depressing moments of my entire existence. Um, dang. Yeah. And I actually thought I had tore a bunch of stuff in my shoulder, but I mean, looking back now, I I had only broken my, uh, my greater tuberosity, but so on that note, um, I had, I spent the, you know, part of the contract with Van Do It was, you know, I was going to be at all these races. I, I had given them my race schedule. I was going to be at all these resort towns all over Colorado and, you know, New Mexico and Utah. And for them, it was great exposure. So it was a good partnership, you know, with me. Right, so, right. um, you know, I had a decision to make, was I going to, just go home and run away? Or was I going to continue on my path and do the best that I could and, you know, still try to represent the van company and still network within the race community. And so I decided to do that and not, you know, not run away from it all. So I spent the first half of the summer rehabbing my shoulder and hiking, and I still would go to the races and support my friends and get exposure to the van and just kind of live the spirit. And then finally, the last half of the summer, I was able to um, at least participate in the last four races of the season. Um, I didn't do as well. I won one of them, but it was a small class. But uh, I didn't do as well as I wanted to in the bigger class just because I I wasn't strong. My shoulder was still hurting, and I kept kind of crashing on it. And it was just kind of one of those things where I just really wanted to do those races to just complete them and not necessarily – like I wanted to win, of course, but I kind of – I knew I wasn't really – strong enough to do it. Um, cause my, I mean, I still have problems with my shoulder. 
So as far as places that are overrated, um, I didn't get to ride as much of the places as I wanted to. But really, honestly, the opposite happened for me because in my travels in my past, since I was living in Texas, I would only travel to go to downhill parks because I've got cross country in Austin. We have great cross country. But, you know, what you can't get there is like lots of elevation with lots of gravity and yeah. downhill trips. So when I would travel to Colorado, I'd take advantage of Lilith served riding, and I didn't ever get to do a lot of backcountry riding. And so um, what I was actually surprised about was how great the riding was outside of the bike parks, and actually some of the bike parks that I had never been to. So, I mean, like I got to go to Aspen Snowmass to do a race there. That was incredible. Absolutely mind-blowing. Snowmass Downhill Park is is insane, and I'd never been. Um, Crested Butte is amazing. Um, Steamboat was awesome. Vail is, you know, is pretty decent. Um, Winter Park, of course. Trestle Downhill Bike Park is, is like, world-class uh, downhill park. And then Glorietta Camps in Santa Fe, I learned, was was amazing. So I actually learned that there's more riding, I guess, better riding than I ever knew that there was out there. Wow. But no park I think of that I think has been stated as, you know, like overrated. Not at all. Good. Because to me, a day on a bicycle, if I can get out there and not crash and, and get an, and get an injury is a good day for me. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. I, I kind of want to talk about what Enduro is because a lot of people don't understand yes. the format or how it came to be. Yeah, please um, explain what it is because, yeah, you're right. Because, it, you know, it's actually um, – I I teach free Enduro clinics to women that want to get into it because right now it's it's a very misunderstood sport by those that have just never tried it before. So like if you break down the history of mountain biking, you've always kind of had XC racing, which is based on endurance and bar to bar racing. You start at the start line and you're all trying to get to the finish line at the same time. Mm. So, you know, you have to have high endurance. Typically, you know, road bikers are big fans of XC racers because they're already really good at endurance and the mountain bike trails that they use aren't typically very technical. Um, it's mainly just single track, you know, long, long distance, single track, um, that is like kind of buffed out, you know, they're, they're riding bikes that are designed to climb and not necessarily designed to descend well, but they climb really, really well. They've got really steep head angles. Typically they're riding a hard tail or a very short travel rear suspension bike because they want to get all the power that they can and not lose it in their suspension. So they just don't usually have a lot of travel in the fork or in the rear. And so then you also historically have had downhill mountain biking, which is the complete opposite. The bikes were meant to descend really fast. They have really large travel uh, suspensions and they don't climb well at all. And so over the last, you know, five, six years, the bike industry has figured out how to design bikes that do both really well. And that's like an all mountain enduro style bike. So you're going to have larger travel bikes, but the geometry allows for a reduction of pedal bob when you go up. Um, they're also building them in 29 inch wheels that just give you, you know, lots of, lots of top end speeds, the ability to, you know, roll over obstacles a lot cleaner than say a 27, five, 27 fives are going to be a little bit more playful um, and they can stop a little faster. They're going to be more nimble, but 29s are, you know, kind of like big wheel trucks. that can just kind mm. of go over any, but anyway, so with the creation of these enduro style bikes, you now are able to take race formats off of the lift served platform and, and put it into backcountry scenarios where you're not just, you're not just downhill racing from the lift down. You're actually having to, pedal through these mountain ranges to get to your stages and so what enduro is basically is a total the format completely depends on the race promoter so you could have a one day format or a two day format um, but the goal is is that you're only racing the downhill portions you have a timer on your bike but you still have to pedal up to get to those downhill stages so mm. 
typically on a Saturday morning, the race, the race will start to, like I said, either a one or two day format. The two days prior to that were typically practice days where they'll give you the map of where all the stages are. So Saturday morning, we have a riders meeting. Everybody has the timers on their bikes. And then, in, and then each class leaves to start pedaling to the first downhill stage. The pedal part is not timed. Those are called the transfers or the transitions. You usually have a time in the day to finish everything. So like they'll say, all right, we're starting at eight, but you got to be back in by three. Some of them give you times that you have to get to your downhill stage. But essentially, once you pedal up to your first stage, there's usually a line because it's a, you know, it's a race and everybody's kind of going at the same time. So you wait in line. Then when you get, when it's your turn, you start at the starting tape at the top. There's usually somebody there regulating the time. And then they tell you to go when it's your turn and you go and you pedal as fast as you can to the bottom. And then there's a timer at the bottom that times you. And so once you get done there, um, you can't, you wait for your group that you're riding with and you all transition together to the next stage. That transition can be anywhere from 10 minutes to three hours, just depending on where you are. So um, you know, like in the, in the Texas, Oklahoma and Arkansas races, we usually do 11 race, 11 stages throughout the weekend because our transitions are much shorter, but in the big mountain races out West, like in Utah, Colorado, your transition times can be anywhere from an hour to three hours. And so a lot of times you can only fit two stages into the day, but like I had a stage in Aspen that was 18 to 20 minutes long. So you're getting some really solid downhill in there. Whereas, yeah. you know, a tech enduro, your stage might be three to six minutes long. Um, so are they considering the difficulty of the transition in the racing as well? Well, I mean, some people might do that. But for pro racers, I mean, you you train to be on your bike that long. So the cool thing about what I think is cool about enduro racing is that I have to be skilled in every single aspect of mountain biking like xc riders i feel like when i meet them their mindset is they got to be really 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 fast at the climb but they almost don't really care about going fast downhill they think well i'll just make it up in the climb well in in xc i mean in a enduro racing you have to be physically fit to be on your bike for you have to be for eight up to eight hours i mean you can be on your bike all day long so if you are not trained endurance wise to endure a, a you know a two hour transition that's straight up the entire time for two straight hours then you're going to be too tired to do well in your downhill so you have to be trained in endurance you have to be trained in sprinting uh, which means you got to incorporate long rides you have to incorporate interval training um, you also have to be really really skilled at the downhill parts you have to train in the bike parks you have to you know you have to learn how to do drops you have to learn how to do gap jumps you have to learn how to do tables uh, now oftentimes in these races there is not often if there is a high penalty feature like a big drop or a gap double there is always a beeline but it gives you a time penalty so if you choose to take the slower route you you know the easier route you will have a time penalty. So it behooves you to be the best you can be at doing those drops, doing those jumps, railing berms, you know, hucking over rock gardens, you know, whatever it is. That's what I love about enduro is it is, it's, you have to have such a wide skill set. And to be good at enduro, I think it it is like the ultimate mountain biker. Like they have everything, which is, which hmm. is, it's just fun. Yeah. It really, it really, <laughs> I can tell you love it. Like, it is. Yeah, I do. I you really, really do. love it, which is awesome. And you mentioned that you coach now. Is that what you do to help support yourself? Um, no, uh, not at all. Um, okay. I'm kind of like in my life trying to figure out how I'm going to support myself because I don't really, I don't really want to go back into the corporate grind. I mean, I have a fantastic resume and I can always go back, but I, mm -hmm. I know that I don't want to. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm right now, I'm, I'm, I'm seeking that, that thing that I think every person going through this same thing that I am is seeking, like, okay, how can I support myself and yet still live my, my dreams and my passions? Yes. Um, yes. Probably, probably a lot like what you're doing, you know, with Definitely. your podcast. Definitely. I would love to be a coach. I think it's my ultimate dream because, um, the most fun days I've ever had on a bike you know, even, even when comparing my race days, some of my most fun days are days where I teach people how to ride enduro. And when they actually succeed, it feels so good. 
Um, and so I, I don't have any coaching certifications. I just um, haven't made the time to get them. Um, it's like something I want to do, but like I keep, you know, there's all this other stuff I want to do too. So it's like, when am I going to find the time? But I need to just do it. But there's a couple level certifications I can get where, you know, it can legitimize my, my coaching. Um, so what I've been doing in lieu of that is uh, I started a Facebook group page in Texas called Texas Women's Gravity Enduro because there are a ton of women that ride XC, but they don't know how to get into enduro. They don't know how to do downhill because, A, they're not riding the right equipment and they don't realize it. Um, they need enduro bikes. They're trying to do this stuff on XC bikes and they have this sense of failure. Well, rightfully so, because I wouldn't do this stuff on an XC bike either. You know, I wouldn't do this drop on a, on a steep head angled bike. You know, there's just so many, there's so many factors in teaching women how to get into it. Um, and so I created this group, um, which now has like a hundred something members in Texas. Um, but I wasn't really reaching for numbers. I was reaching for, you know, quality. Um, and so once I gained a kind of a following within my, um, within my group, cause I was kind of looked up to in that area cause I was winning races and, you know, all of the females that were like, were striving for that, like kind of looked up, looked up to me. And so gaining a following was pretty easy. And then once I did that, I started putting on free enduro clinics to a, just kind of get a sense of how I do coach and how people respond to my coaching. And it turned out that they responded really, really well. And so it did light my fire to become a coach. So my next step is just to, you know, get my certifications and, uh, you know, just start something here in Utah, because what I have found here in Utah specifically is there is a very, very broken mountain bike community that are not, they don't mesh well together. Um, and enduro is very, very slow here. Nobody, nobody really understands what it is because there's no races out here. There's only one race. Um, is just so ripe for good biking out here. So one of my goals in, in moving and living in Utah is to, uh, I would like to be a super strong voice in getting the mountain bike community specifically for like enduro and gravity minded folks. Cause there's plenty of XC riders here. It's 90% of the people that ride here are XC. Um, and, uh, because they've, they, they've never ridden on an enduro bike. And so trails have to be built differently for these, the, this new style of bike, you have to, it's like the trails have to evolve with the equipment. So historically, you know, I said, you have an XC bike, you've got a downhill bike. So they, you know, at the downhill park, like Deer Valley, you've got downhill trails for the downhill bikes. Great. Everywhere else, the trails are built for XC bikes, which, you know, instead of like when you've got this beautiful terrain the they're building trails along the ridge line rather than utilizing the ridge line's gravity to create fun flowy lines right so it as these bikes have evolved um unfortunately the utah trail building has not evolved with the bikes so there's this void right now between downhill and xc there's just no there's no enduro style trails or few of them and so uh my goal is to figure out who i have to talk to uh, I'm going to, I'm going to make a Facebook page called, um, Utah gravity enduro, which I've actually already made. I just need to like get, you know, actually get it published. Um, but I want to bring the gravity minded people together that can help. So, you know, be a, a niche community that wants to come out and build trail and get approvals and, and really like catch up with the rest of the world. Because I, I, what, from what I have seen, Utah is the absolute slowest to catch on to this style riding, which that's the direction that the industry is going. So it needs to be done. Oh yeah. That, wow. I find that really crazy because any given weekend in the summer from Denver, there is just a line of cars with mountain bikes on the back or on top heading to Moab, heading to Southern Utah. Well, so Southern Utah is great. Moab's great, but like Northern Utah, like up here in Ogden and yeah, like Park, yeah. City, Park City has great riding, but like all of the sort of outline like Ogden Ogden is a perfect example we have so much terrain up here there's so I mean I'm like I'm sitting here right now looking at incredible mountain bike terrain that's not being utilized um so it's just like getting these little these little outer communities that still have great terrain to kind of catch on because it's old school mentality but but yeah Moab and St. George like that area that 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 riding is is incredible incredible so we just got to get the rest of the rest of the world caught up rest of the Utah Awesome. So, you know, with your 
your big life transition and, and trying to make it on your own and around your passions, how difficult has that been so far? Super. One of the ways that I was going to support myself was by selling vans. Hmm. And Van Do It has a really, really incredible build out. Um, they do it on, on Ford Transit uh, chassis. But what I have found when talking to people that are interested in buying vans is that they just, they research, 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 re- and they take forever to make decisions. And so like, there are some people that I've been working with for six months answering questions about the van build out. It's just selling, selling adventure, adventure vans has been a little bit more difficult than I thought it would be because there's so many um, builders out there that are starting to come out, you know, that are like, you know, one one man jobs that are trying to to build these awesome custom vans. So there's just there's a lot of options for people on which van to get, what style they want, you know, and it's a hard decision to make. I knew immediately seeing Van Do It Vans, it is the exact van that I wanted to get into. Uh, that's been tough. Also, you know, living on the road, I don't always have the internet access, or I didn't. I'm I'm stable now and I'm settled now, but um, in Utah, but. Um, that, and I, I don't know if it was, if it was my fault, um, that I didn't sell as much product as I wanted to. Cause you know, I could have sold wheels for, uh, for we are one, but it would have basically required me to become a sales rep again and go cold call on, you know, bike shops. And, and I think that during this summer, during my, my sabbatical, I didn't want to work. Like I wanted some time for the first time in my life to just not sell. You know, I've been selling stuff since I got out of college and I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I got burned out of trying to talk people into things. And so I just really wanted a break. So I spent this, this summer just really not worrying cause I saved up enough money, um, in my device career that, you know, I, I've been comfortable and not struggling. And so I, I think that it was just a direct result of my lack of effort. But now that I'm in Utah and I am settled and I do have a job with Whisper Ridge, I, I have that fire back, you know, to, to create success and just build, build my next chapter. And so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm definitely constantly searching for what that might be. You know, you're going to, you just keep your eyes open. Of course, uh, you're going to have opportunities like selling those wheels, but it sounds like you just wasn't going to be a good fit for what you were needing at the time. So, you know, that's what I tell a lot of people. I, I, you can beat yourself up all day over the missed opportunities, but there are just millions of opportunities out there. And if you just yeah. keep looking and you're just even a little bit diligent and uh, just stay a little organized with it, you can make a lot of headway really quickly. And it sounds like that just wasn't a good fit. So it's probably best that you didn't go do that right now. Maybe you will at some point, but but for now, at least. And, and that wasn't necessarily... This episode is brought to us by Oris watches. You know what piece of equipment on any adventure that I'm uh, honestly surprised by how much I use is my watch. And I'm wearing a watch right now. I always have a watch on. And I believe that you should check out Oris Watches. Oris is a 119-year-old family-owned independent watch brand based out of Halstein, Switzerland. The brand has been certified climate and carbon neutral since 2021 and every year releases a sustainability report. Oris only makes mechanical watches like the new Pro Pilot X Caliber 400 and the new Pro Pilot Altimeter featuring a 3D printed carbon case. If you're a fan of mechanical watches like I am, there's nothing in the game that's better than Oris and you can discover the full Oris collection at a retailer near you or at oris.ch. So if you want that one piece of equipment in your life to be functional, to be useful, to be beautiful, artistic, check out Oris Watches. Oris, go your own way. This episode is brought to us by Oris Watches. You know what piece of equipment on any adventure that I'm uh, honestly surprised by how much I use is my watch. And I'm wearing a watch right now. I always have a watch on. And I believe that you should check out Oris Watches. Oris is a 119-year-old family-owned independent watch brand based out of Halstein, Switzerland. The brand has been certified climate and carbon neutral since 2021 and every year releases a sustainability report. Oris only makes mechanical watches like the new Pro Pilot X Caliber 400 and the new Pro Pilot Altimeter featuring a 3D printed carbon case. If you're a fan of mechanical watches like I am, 
There's nothing in the game that's better than Oris, and you can discover the full Oris collection at a retailer near you or at oris.ch. So if you want that one piece of equipment in your life to be functional, to be useful, to be beautiful, artistic, check out Oris watches. Oris, go your own way. So like the way I, I mean, they, they sponsor, like we are one wheel uh, composite sponsored my racing. They, they gave, you know, they gave me a couple sets of wheels and, um, you know, I give them some pretty decent content on social media. And, you know, also with Van Do It, I had a, this grand plan to like be a, become a YouTuber and, you know, like document my whole journey. And, you know, I just kind of got tired of uh, always filming and talking. And I, I I didn't feel like being a YouTuber was a, a real sustainable career for me because, I'm just not sure that like always having a camera open is, is the kind of lifestyle that I want. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I get you that know, like, completely. And, and the editing, like I, I, you know, I, I, I've never had anybody teach me how to edit. And so I just kind of felt stumped by, uh, by technology, you know, I, I just wasn't, and I could probably still do it. I mean, I've still got all the footage. I could probably still put together some, some videos and stuff, but honestly, I don't know how to make a movie or, you know, I don't know. I have, Adobe, uh, what is it? Lightroom or uh, final cut pro. I have all that, but I don't know how to use it. And so <laughs> right. I'm stumped by that. Yeah, I get it. I, I I've thought about that too. Like, Oh, make videos. Cause I got a cousin that's like doing that and doing well, but I sit down to edit hours worth of footage. Forget that. That's about the last thing I want to sit down and do in front of a screen, you know? I think a lot of people enjoy that part of it, though, and that's great for them. Yes, and they're the ones that need to do it, not me. <laughs> yeah, and so those YouTubers are successful. They're, mm -hmm. you know, doing well. Um, I've heard mixed reviews about how much of a, of a uh, you know, income you can make on, you know, I think some make really good good living on it, some struggle. My, my basic lack of knowledge in, in movie making would have caused me to struggle for longer than I wanted. And then kind of get to a point where I burn out. Yeah. So it's just not a strong place for me. So I think where I need to find my strong place is, uh, you know, just figuring out, like, I, I know that I would be a, a killer coach. And so. I, it, it sounds like you really know your, 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 uh, your sport and love to learn about it. So I, I think I agree. I think I'm a good teacher too. Like, uh, when I am out with the women, they, I, the compliment I always get is, is the way, the way that I motivate them. And, um, I just really, I, I just really love to do that. So I think that's the direction I'm going to end up going, but first I'm going to focus on, on Whisper Ridge. Um, I get to go to a uh, backcountry guide school the first week of December to learn how to be a guide, which I'm super stoked about. I'm not necessarily going to make that my career, but, um, it's just kind of like something fun to do. And I'm just, I'm, I'm really excited to do that. So when you made this big transition, you got in touch with Van Do It, and you and you lived in a big Sprinter van and went around racing. I got a couple questions about that. That was sure. a short term experience, six months, right? Um, yes, but I still have the van, and oh, I still, okay. I, I yeah, I didn't get rid of it. I, I that was just like a point where I was actually living in it every day. Okay, it, so tell us what was that like living in a van, going from corporate America to living in a van every day of your life? Amazing. Oh, best experience man. I've ever had. There's definitely some challenges to overcome in the beginning, but then it all becomes routine. So my van has, it's a, uh, it's a Ford transit passenger van. Um, the van do it build outs are very modular. They use extruded aluminum T track to essentially build out the van and change it as you need it, depending on what adventure you're going on. It's got a really awesome gear slide in the back. Um, I can fit and my bed is on hydraulics, so I can actually fit five, I can fit two road bikes and three mountain bikes on, on my gear slide in the back under my bed, and the whole platform pulls out. Um, I have an onboard air compressor, I've got water, I've got a shower, it's an outboard shower, not, it's not inside the van. Um, I've got a sink, I've got, you know, full electricity, solar, solar uh, panels, 320 watts of solar, um, I've got three solar batteries as a secondary battery bank. So essentially I had every single thing that I needed. Oh, and I also took with me a, uh, a toilet that is a, it's called the dry flush toilet. Um, you can find them on Amazon, I think, but they're, uh, they're kind of like the diaper genie. They have seven feet of bag that's attached to a motor at the bottom. So basically 
the um you you go um and I reserved it for number two because P is actually what stinks over time as it gets older and the the poo actually like will stink less over time and so the recommendation I had was to not ever pee in it was always just use it for number two um so you act you go in it and like a diaper genie it's got a a a motor that actually like twists the bag shut to where it doesn't stink it doesn't let out any fumes and then opens up the next section of bag and so you basically are making a chain of poo inside your toilet (laughs) (laughs) so there's, awesome. no, there's no water um you charge the toilet once and it, it lasted me all summer uh it's a really really cool toilet um and i really only used it for emergencies like if i was at a race and i the only place to park was in a parking lot and maybe pretty far away from the bathrooms and i woke up and it was like duty calls i would go right then instead of going to hunt for a bathroom another uh another trick to a lot of people ask is um well okay as a female living in a van how did you like what was the pee situation like because for for a woman to have to get out of the van and go find a place to pee like you know that can sometimes be precarious if i you know sometimes i would sleep in a parking lot like if i was coming into a town and maybe there's like, you know, it was late and I didn't want to find a camp spot. I would find like a Walmart parking lot anywhere that, I mean, my van is super stealth. It's black and it looks kind of like a utility van. So really no one ever knew I was sleeping in it. So basically I could just park wherever I wanted to, as long as, you know, for safety reasons, as long as I felt safe, um, I would park there. And sometimes in a parking lot, you don't want to get out and, and pee in the parking lot in public. So actually I had the opportunity to go and work for work the booth i had never heard do you know what outdoor retailer is oh yeah i'm a huge fan go every year i live like 10 minutes from there oh uh so i i really had no idea what i was getting into but van do it um part of my contract is that um i work events whenever they need reps to go but so van do it asked me to go and you know I, i really had no idea what it was i was just like okay cool and as i like a couple days before i sort of started researching it and realized how big of an event it was started getting really excited I didn't realize it was just you know I didn't realize it was just a a retailer event that it wasn't really open to the public so um, I went there with the mindset of I'm gonna go network not only work for Van Do It but network my myself as an athlete that's actually where I met Peak Refuel oh cool and I'll and I'll tell that story in a minute but uh, one of the coolest, probably the, the absolute neatest product, my number one favorite product of the year, other than my van itself, is a product called the Tinkle Bell. And uh, it, it, I have it, it, an it, idea of what that might be. <laughs> it allows a, a woman to stand and pee. And now there are a lot of other brands. There's like the Go Girl, the Shiwi. I have tried in, in my past all of those. And I didn't like any of them because they all still required you to kind of pull your pants down. You still had to expose your butt. Um, the, the funnel was not long, so you'd pee on yourself. And I just found all of them to be just kind of crappy products in general. And so this, this is a startup company, the Tinkle Bell, the owners came up to me and just handed me one. They were like, please give us your feedback. You know, you're a female, you're into the outdoors. We'd love to hear back from you. So I took it. And that night, actually, I was I, I had parked my van in the front parking lot in front of outdoor retailer. It's like a fifty dollar a night thing. It was really expensive, but and so I wasn't going to move my van anywhere. So having to sleep at night in a parking lot where there was no way to use the bathroom anywhere close, um, I was like perfect opportunity to use this thing. So I had an empty bottle, I had my Tinkle Bell, and I used it for the first time, and it blew my mind. And it is now my favorite item to date of anything. It has been the most helpful thing. So now when I'm in my van anywhere, instead of getting out to pee, I go right there. I always have an empty bottle and it is just so easy to stand and pee right there in my van. It's not messy. I don't spill it anywhere. It is awesome. And so um, that's been a huge question for me is how do you go to the bathroom and how do you shower in the van? And for me, I don't know if it's because I'm a female And I'm outgoing, but kind of all summer, no matter where I went, I was offered a hot shower somewhere. So I only had to use my shower, my van shower, like three times. Wow. 
I think just van life in general, that's, you know, people always have those questions. Where can I shower and where can I go to the bathroom? Um, everything else, you know, it's sleeping is, it's super comfortable. I have a vent fan in my ceiling. I turn that on at night and it totally cuts out all of the, the noise. So if I'm sleeping by a, a busy street, I can't hear anything. Um, so yeah, so those are kind of the two, the two bigger challenges, uh, for van lifing that I have figured out. Wow. So it doesn't sound like it really got old to you then. No, I loved it. And I, you know, just because I didn't really make much money this summer, I did really, you know, I was like, you know, even though I want to keep doing this, I really, you know, I do need to find a stream of income before, you know, it gets to the point where I don't have any money. Uh, Cause right now I'm still, you know, I'm still comfortable um, and not stressing about making, you know, a huge income, but it's going to get to a point here real soon that, you know, I'm going to be ready to start making some money. I'm working on a commission basis with uh, Whisper Ridge right now as they're uh, kind of growing their business. And that'll probably change, you know, in the next few months. But uh, yeah. for now, it's kind of eat what you kill sort of thing, which is fine because it keeps me, you know, keeps me on my toes. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Yeah, and I, thanks for being honest. By the way, uh, we I, I love it because we do we do this series every Friday called Life Outside the Box. I'm going to put you on that show, and it's just basically like, what is it like to pursue your passions and try to make a career at the very least a side hustle? Because a lot of people want to do it, a lot of people don't ever take any sort of leap. You took a huge leap, huge, um, huge, and. You know, and, and we would like to say, I don't care, like, if it works or doesn't, taking that leap is, at some point in your life, you're going to want to do it, or you got it, you got to at least try, even if it yeah. just crumbles to the ground, sit back and be happy and know that I, I, I was out there, I was in, I was in the game, I wasn't on the sideline totally. criticizing everybody. Can I ask you this, when living in your van, did you get better at your, at your sport? being able to focus uh, on it more? Um, no, actually. And oh, only yeah? because I was dealing with a broken shoulder. So that's kind of a hard oh, question to answer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, you know, there were lots of points in the summer where I was just like, what am I doing? You know, like <laughs> I'm a 37 year old woman <laughs> with a broken shoulder out here making no, no money, trying to live this you know, I'm a pro racer kind of mentality. And you know what? I just, I had to come to the conclusion that that's okay. Cause that's, that's what I wanted to do. It, it's what happened. And so, um, instead of crying about it, instead of being depressed about it, I just, um, adapted and overcame the circumstances. And I, I earned this job through Whisper Ridge. And so I'm, I'm actually really, really stoked where I've landed because there's such incredible opportunity with the growth of this company. I'm really, really, really happy with, with kind of what's happening so far. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in the pipeline and, and to be honest, I mean, yes, I may race next summer. I, I likely will, but, uh, I think the opportunity here at Whisper Ridge is almost, it's, a, it's kind of too hard to pass up. So it will depend on, uh, on what happens with this on, on if I keep racing next summer. Um, mm. cause I'd like to try it again, you know, w w injury free, you know, to see how I do. Um, cause the last four races I did, I raced through pain, um, and, and through a mental block of, of don't crash, don't crash, don't crash. Cause don't re-injure your shoulder. And that actually caused me to crash more because it was just a mindset, you know, I was stuck in this gutter of, of being scared while I ride. And that, that, that never is good. That's a never, never, never a good combination. No. Um, but I, I got mentally stronger. Definitely. I may not have gotten better at my craft, but I got, I got, uh, I, I went through a lot of huge, uh, learning, um, th things this summer, which was good. I'm, I'm, I'm currently working on my mindset. I'm listening to a lot of like, um, like Tony Robbins. He's so awesome at like, at motivational stuff. I've got a couple podcasts that I listen to that I just turn on every morning and it like totally switches my mind around, like just how to live positively and live for the moment and be, be thankful and have, you know, gratitude and, uh, not letting these, these thoughts that creep in that cause me to worry about my future. They're, they're pointless. They don't do mm. anything 
Worrying does absolutely nothing. So I just try to like learn how to cut those, uh, those thoughts off immediately. And it is actually these podcasts have changed my life just in a matter of months. Wow. Um, I'm, great, I'm grateful for that. And if I had not co- come on this journey, I'd still be stuck in that corporate grind, not having tried to better my, my mind state. Um, and so just that alone was worth this journey. Even if, even if nothing comes out of this, I've learned how to control my mind, um, which has been just absolutely invaluable that's, for me. Yeah, I was going to say that's priceless. And I would say this, if you would have stuck with that job, you know what? You'd be laying in your bed in your house one night thinking, what am I doing? Rather than in your van with a broken shoulder. So it's kind of all relative, you know? Completely. Yeah. My, my stress level now, like, it's amazing what stress does to your body. And like, yes, I haven't made money all summer. And that part is a little bit worrisome. But I know that I could, if I wanted to start making money now, I could somehow. I could go back to whatever. But just not having that like daily, you know, the boss asking, you know, you know, what are you going to close today? Like just this, this daily like pressure of meeting quotas and, and it it just got so stressful that like, I would, I would just have this ball of stress in my gut every single day. And that is so unhealthy for people. And I don't have that anymore. That alone, even though I don't have a, a, a big revenue stream coming in right now, that alone is happiness to me. So I'm cool with it. That's awesome. And I have to say, that's the reality of this. When you when you pursue something, I quit what I was doing about six months ago and to pursue my passions full time and they ain't got a paycheck. It's been stressful. I will lay in bed a lot thinking like, what the heck am I doing with my life? And then there's these little wins here and there And I realized, wow, these little wins are so meaningful. When I had wins in my old career, I would kind of sit back and think, I'm not really all that proud of that. Like I am, it's like a, you know, I was had it on my mind and it's a relief, but in reality, I'm not super stoked about it. Now when there's a win, it's like completely life-giving. I don't know how to explain it. You know what I'm saying? It is. Yeah, it's great. That's that's really awesome. Where did you come from? What's your what's your background? Well, um, man, all kinds of things. I was a I was a bike packer and bike tourer for a long time and traveled around for like really long stints and met I met a girl. We got married pretty quick and uh settled in Denver and uh she teaches here in town. She's a teacher and I ran a little painting business, like house painting. Uh-huh. Um, and I just had done it all through college, grew up doing it, and we moved here with no plan. So that was really easy to get into. Did that for a few years, and I'm like, I could grow this and start you know, hiring more people and a crew. And I just thought, oh, my God, forget this. And so I, I tried to, to start a bunch of little side hustles in the meantime, but every one of them were just you know, failing one after another. Finally, mm-hmm. one to, got some uh, traction, and I'm like, I just got to go all for it. And, you know, it's been, it's been really hard, honestly, but I will say it's kind of what life is about. Like I I'm really honestly content with laying in bed at night sleepless because the concerns on my mind are revolving around the things that I feel I was born to do, if that makes sense. Yeah. Which is what, what is your passion? Oh, um, I love connecting people with the outdoors, with nature. And so uh, from guided trips to sending people backpacking, which is what I do now, it's like a backpacking travel agency. Uh Um, And, you know, it's a slow build, but it's like, it's like planting an acorn, you know, you you know, those mighty oaks that are down in the South. I'm from the South. I'm from Florida. And we just got these huge oak trees that just, they're huge. They're like uh, cathedrals underneath the canopies. And, and cool. just to think that they start from those little acorns, it's unbelievable. And so I just, it's a slow grind like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And totally. I would say the concerns before with like, oh, I got to get this job done. I got to please this this boss on this job, on this contract. And uh, it, it, like, I don't care what color your four year is. I don't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, totally. It's not your passion. Yeah, exactly. So I totally get what you're saying. Um, 
it's stressful and it is a comfort knowing, you know, if this didn't work out, like you said, you could jump into a job somewhere. You'd be fine. Mm-hmm. You could just got a little life you got, you're going to live. You might as well chase something super hard and do something, you know, pretty ne- unique with it. Like you've, like you've done in the last few years. Yeah. Um, you know, the key to a lot of people don't get, and I'm still trying to like, to learn that too, is, is patience and persistence. Oh yeah. Um, patience. Because it's so easy to quit right at the last minute, right when things are about to open up and you don't realize it. And it take and it takes a grind, you know, like nobody that's successful is successful overnight, you know, unless there's some trust fund kid or whatever. But, but people that are trying to build something out of nothing, they, it just usually doesn't happen overnight. They spend years and years and years and they work every single day. And, you know, that's the, that's the life of a, of a modern day entrepreneur, you know, there's, there's just so much to do from the marketing, the social media, the product, the service, like everything, you know, it's not easy. And so you have to just, you just have to work super hard. Yep. I think that's a lot of people don't get. Yep. And, and, and every once in a while, someone might have it a little easier, but don't be fooled. That is by no means going to be most likely the case for you. Uh, for me, for anyone else out there listening to this. And I would have to say, I'm glad you brought that up too. One of my saving graces in the last few years have been podcasts. Oh yeah? As funny as that is, I tell people that like don't get it. It's almost, it's like therapy. You know, there's a show about anything and everything and you get attached to the, the consistency of the show coming out. Like, all right, it's Tuesday or Thursday or whatever. And it just gets you out of your mind set and get someone else to influence it with, you know, more, more positive uh, approach. It's like, it brings the insight of reading, but gives you the freedom to do other things. Like you could ride your bike and listen to all of the podcasts you want to. And you still get that same like education that you would from a book. You know, I think that's one thing. Oh, totally. Podcasting. It's crazy. I, I haven't done it until this summer. I, I just didn't know about it. Mm. You know, like I would see all these people like posting podcasts and but I just, I guess I really didn't understand the concept of it. Um, I guess I've been living under a rock. I don't know. But I just got turned on this summer to listening to podcasts. And, and you know, because I'm not one to sit down and finish a book. I hate to read. Not uh, because me I'm too. taking in content, but I'm just, I'm a doer, you know. I mean, I stand when I eat. I don't, I don't have TV. I don't have cable. You I don't... stand when you pee, too. Exactly. <laughs> Let eat them ring. Uh, a... <laughs> <laughs> pee freely. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. I can't sit down and read a book either. So it, it's really helpful to listen to it in that way. Totally. I love and actually, that's one thing that helps me get through my long bike rides is I'll just listen to a podcast. And it's like time goes by like crazy, especially when it's a really good one. Um, so I can completely understand how that would that would cure you because it, it really has for me too. Um, and this is my first time being on one. And it's really exciting. I love it. Oh, good. Yeah. And every Friday we share a story similar to yours where it's like uh, we just had a guy who's building an outdoor gear shop here in Denver, a pretty successful so far. But he's like he had to live in his van for seven months in like a parking lot to make it. And he's like, it's like three degrees outside me and my dog in my van. And I've got this business that I'm in charge of. And I lay in my van thinking, like, what am I doing with my life? It's very similar in that sense. Yeah, totally. (laughs) <laughs> and there's so many moments where you want to quit. Like you legitimately, I, I just a few weeks, probably last week, honestly, I was at the point where, please just take this off my hands. I would, I just forget all this. And then you, you reach a breakthrough like right after that. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. It's almost like set up that way to where anytime there's this super, super hard go, there's a small crack in, in that challenge right after that. And if, if for the people that keep pushing the people that are persistent and are you are wise with it you know there's a there's a mm-hmm. point where you need to stop but you know if you can yeah. keep going man it's gonna it's gonna break at some point and you're gonna you're gonna get a win yeah i think one of the uh the best quotes that my one of my old bosses um, ever gave me. It was, it was a time in my sales, like we, we were having a rough quarter and I was, you know, I was just really down cause I'd worked so hard and 
my numbers weren't good at that time. And there was just all these things going wrong with it, the deals I was working on. And he said to me, and I'd never heard anybody say this, and it's just very simple, but nothing is ever as good or as bad as it seems. So on the days when it just seems like, man, I, nothing's going right for me. And, you know, what, I got I to gotta do something different. I just have to tell myself, no, today's just a bad day. Tomorrow it's going to be better. And then even when you have a win, you know, you can't let your guard down because you got to keep working. Like that win doesn't mean you, you, you take a vacation and, and stop working hard because it's not as good as it seems. It's always, it's always going to be up and down. So you have to be prepared for that. Um, and that's something I've had to definitely had to work through for sure in my career. That's great advice. I'm, I'm going to hold on to that. That's uh, someone taught me a story about that one time about a guy with a horse. You know, he he's like he he just would not let himself go up or down, and he said, uh, but the people around him would. A horse ran away, and the horse that he used to plow his field, he's like, "Don't worry, it's gonna be fine. Like I can't let it get me down." The next day, the horse comes back with twenty five other horses. Nice. So the son rounds it up, him and his son, and then his son tries to tame all of them because they're all wild. The next day, his son's riding one of these like wild Mustangs, and it bucks him off, and he breaks his leg. And everyone's like, "No, what are you gonna do? You know, your son is—he's got a broken leg. You know, the harvest season's coming up. You're gonna need him. You're gonna need his help." And he's like, "It's gonna be okay." The next day, there was like a national draft to go into war, and his son would have surely been sent to the front lines if it were not for his broken leg. And so he <laughs> got to stay at home. The leg eventually healed. The war was over. And it just taught him, like, you cannot, awesome. you cannot let yourself get swept up in the emotional roller coaster of your circumstances. Totally. That's a great story. I, I love that one. Yeah, I think there's more to it. There's like two or three more stories, but I totally forgot. But you get the picture. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a, a similar scenario happened with my broken shoulder. It It led me to something that... I would have never been led to had I not broken my shoulder. Um, and I am, I am actually grateful for that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, completely. And, uh, yeah, it, it's just, it was awesome. So I, that alone taught me that, you know, if something horrible happens today, it's okay. I'm just going to deal with it and tomorrow will be better. I mean, it's just, it's, it's life. We are going to, we are never going to stop having crappy days. We are never going to stop having wonderful days. It's just the way life is, and we have to just deal with them as they come and not let your emotions control your thoughts because your thoughts and your mind completely control your life. That is absolutely true. Yeah, it's the power of your thoughts really creates your reality. Totally. So... You're gonna be you're gonna be at uh, Whisper Ridge for the winter, um, mm -hmm. and then you're gonna. I think you're gonna be coaching at some point. So how how can people get in touch with you if they want to follow you? Um, my uh, my Instagram is a great place um, to kind of see what my shenanigans are and to send me send me messages. Um, I'm on Facebook too. Nature and my hobbies are the you know, the things that I focus on you know, in my job. And so, uh, Instagram, my, uh, my Instagram handle is underscore helmet hair underscore. Okay. Underscore helmet hair underscore. Yeah. So, uh, I would love to follow anybody that follows me and see what they're up to. Uh, I'm, I'm really interactive on, on Instagram and usually respond to everybody that, that interacts with me and, I just, I love that platform. I'm not on Snapchat or anything. I don't, I just, you know, social media is tough as it is. You know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work and it's almost like a necessary evil to, especially when yeah. you're trying to build something like what you're doing, but at least you get to look at a lot of pretty pictures on uh, Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. Yeah. Not a lot of uh, opinions on Instagram as much. Yeah. So, <laughs> exactly. That is a huge plus. Well, Man, Angie, I really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. And you know what? Shout out to our Peak Refuel friends. Oh, yeah. Because uh, those dudes are incredible. They fully sponsor and support my racing. 
I've got their logo on the side of my van. I met them at Outdoor Retailer, and they are just an incredible group of dudes that are making an awesome freeze-dried meals for, uh, you know, like camping out in the mountains or, you know, anybody that needs it for, for races. And uh, I, I anybody that buys Backpackers Pantry or any of the other you know, competitors needs to seriously try Peak Refuel because I think that they are, they taste better than any of them and they use, you know, way better ingredients. Which one's your favorite? Oh, without a doubt, the beef marinara and the fettuccine, the pasta fettuccine. It's so good. I so, actually, so good. I outfitted a trip recently for like 10, 12 guys with that. And that's what we ate. It's the best backpacking food I've ever had. <laughs> it is awesome. At the end of every one of my backpacking days, I just, I cannot wait. It's like my, it's like what I look, you know, it's like, okay, today I'm hiking for beef marinara. <laughs> that's what I, that, that's what I'm going to eat at the end of the day. It's like a, it's like a creamy beef marinara. It's so good. I love that's it. That's funny. But thanks for having me on, yeah. Jason. I really appreciate it. It's yeah. Good fun. and good luck. Good luck with everything this winter. And uh, I'll be following you now. So, so I'll see how you're doing. Same to you. I will uh, definitely keep in touch. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun. <laughs>